Thanks, everybody, for coming today. Uh, we're extremely pleased that you're able to join us, honored that you could attend. As Andrew said, uh, it's a little early local time, as I understand it. Uh, really happy that you could all be here. Uh, before I jump into the content, I would love to get a little bit of a sense of who we have in the audience today. So uh, prepare yourself in advance. There's going to be a bunch of show of hands exercises. Let's start with what you all do. So let's see a show of hands. Who in the audience is a mobile app developer or publisher or works with mobile app developers or publishers? Excellent. Uh, who is a buyer of mobile advertising? All right. Who has a mobile DSP or an ad network? Who considers themselves purely mobile ad technology? All right, great mix of people. So the presentation we're going to give today, I want to give a, a couple notes about before we start. One is we're very much focused on the sell side here, yield management. Um, I'll define it in a second, but effectively it's about taking the asset that you have in your audience and your inventory and making the most out of it. Um, so a lot of the concepts here are going to be mostly applicable to sellers. Um, the second thing that I want to share in advance is that some of the material uh, we've tried to make pretty deep in terms of the content. So I'm going to do my best not to put you to sleep. Uh, Andrew's on point to let me know if more than 40% or so of you are actually asleep, uh, he'll let me know. Anyway, let's jump into it. So AppNexus powers the advertising that powers the internet. A little bit about us, uh, some numbers. In addition to being the world's largest independent ad tech company. Uh, we're about 800 people in 22 offices worldwide. We now see a couple billion dollars of spend transacted on our platform. Uh, we serve about 34 billion ads per day, and that's all growing very quickly. Um, so platform at scale. I uh, want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the team that's pulled this content together for us today. So I'm going to take full credit for everything that I say, particularly the smart parts. But we have a mix of folks from our product team, uh, Errol Ledeau and Mike McNeely, who are here. If you could raise your hands, they'll be available to answer tough questions later. Uh, we also have an awesome team of yield management professionals that bring real expertise from outside the ads industry, uh, as well as a large data science team that brings uh, expertise from all kinds of different disciplines into helping us solve quantitative problems that, again, drive value for publishers and people that work with publishers. Now I want to talk a little bit about why mobile is particularly important for us. Uh, so over the last year, we've seen mobile activity on our platform pretty much explode. Uh, you know, it was reasonably large for us at the end of last year, or 2013. From 2013 to 2014, we've grown to the point where we now see about 21 billion impressions available programmatically every day. That's across the entire ecosystem. It translates to something like 640 billion impressions a month. So what does that mean? There is a tremendous amount of mobile supply out there in the ecosystem that needs to be yield managed. Uh, also, spend is important. So, you know, if it's just supply and there, the dollars aren't there, I don't think any of us are terribly interested in that. Uh, we've seen the spend grow 450 plus percent year over year, and uh, we're on a pretty big base now. So, we don't release the actual spend figures, but I can tell you we're talking substantial nine figure type numbers. So, that's why we care about mobile. Now, let me introduce the flow of what we're going to talk about. Briefly, uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of history. What is yield management? How do we define it? How is it applied? We're going to try to share what we understand in our research to be state-of-the-art in other industries, particularly airlines. Uh, we're going to talk about why it's hard to bring that state-of-the-art into mobile. Advertising presents some really unique challenges. And obviously, if it was easy, we would all be doing it, and I would be asleep probably hungover. Um, 
And then we'll get to the future. So how do we address those challenges? Where are we gonna go to make things better for everybody? But let's start with the definition. So yield management, controlling fixed perishable resource availability to affect pricing in order to maximize revenue. That implies that there's some key conditions going on that I'll talk about in a second. But first, a little history. So the first known inventory management exercise was documented by a story of some guy, 40 days of rain, builds a big boat, animals two by two, preserving inventory for later use. Um, I think everyone's probably familiar with that story. From there, we moved to uh, the mid 1500s, 1600s. Merchants actually started writing down inventory of things. That was a new concept then. Um, they did that so they didn't have to walk to the stable or across town or what have you to figure out how much they had of something. And in the 40s and 50s, large companies started thinking about managing inventory through centralized systems. A few years later, the British Overseas Air Company had the brilliant insight that they could charge a different price for an airline ticket if someone was willing to book it in advance. That concept didn't exist really before 1970. People would just show up and pay. Uh, airline had no idea how many people were gonna show up. People had no idea if they were gonna be able to get on the plane. Barcodes show up four years later. Four years after that, in the United States, the airline industry deregulates. This is really important for the development of yield management. It's a little bit obscure, but in the United States, prior to this deregulation, prices were fixed. Airlines literally had to charge a government set fee for every seat, for every route. Shortly after that, people began to innovate in yield management. At American Airlines, they invented the concept of a super saver fare. This was the first time that uh, an airline realized they could charge a different price for the same seat depending on the day of the week targeted at a business traveler versus a family vacationer. Same seat, same cost, different price. And then finally ending up late 90s, which is now 20 years ago, uh, United, uh, sorry, American and other airlines invented what's called origin and destination yield management. In advertising, we would call it holistic or global yield management. And that's essentially the idea of not trying to optimize an individual seat's revenue, but trying to think about every decision about every airline seat in terms of how the entire network um, maximizes yield against that. So briefly, why isn't yield management applied everywhere? There's all kinds of in industries that have inventory and consumers and pricing and so forth. Just a couple of examples here. Retail, uh, when you go to the Apple store to buy an, iP an iPod or whatever the latest device is, you're not expecting to get a real-time price that changes all the time. Uh, I'm not gonna charge Errol $149 and David $249 when they're standing next to each other that would probably cause a little bit of an issue. Similar thing in, in telco. Their inventory is perishable. Bandwidth goes away, it doesn't last forever. But consumers expect fixed pricing. So when their bill shows up every month, you see $99, $99, not $5,000 one month, something much less another time. In aviation, again, what makes this possible is the inventory is perishable. Customers do understand and do expect that prices will change based on a variety of different factors. And they also have you know, very large fixed costs. So the opportunity to do yield management means they can actually make a lot more money. Ads, pretty similar for the reasons that I think you're all picking up on. Um, so that leads me to my next hand raising exercise. Uh, I would like everyone to think for just a second about how much they paid in dollars or euros to fly to Barcelona. All right, if you paid 500 euros or dollars or less to get to Barcelona, raise your hand. Okay, 500 to 1,000. 
1,000 to 2,000. I'm just going to keep going. 3,000 to 4,000. Hi, Ben. We're going to hang out later. You're <laughs> buying me lunch. 4,000 to 5,000. Anybody? OK, so over 5,000? OK, so 3,000 to 4,000 is where we top out. This is really important because the sort of 5% or so of you paying 3,000 to 4,000, uh, the cost of those seats is the same, effectively, as the people that paid under $500. And I'm going to guess, by the way, if we average out your under 500, it's 300. It's probably not 400 or 500. The difference between those prices is literally 10x. So I'm not going to try to do the math in my head, but if I were to try and I did it, I think what you'd find is an exorbitant amount of the profit that collectively the airlines derived from getting us all here was Ben. And the other 5% that paid three to $4,000. Okay. So very important concept. We'll hit that later. All right, what's state of the art? So I'm going to use a little bit of a, uh, a chain of activities here to describe the next couple sections, collecting data, segmenting data, forecasting, optimization, and execution. Uh, it all starts with data, but it's also important to note the total yield management impact you're going to have for any process that you go through like this is only as good as the weakest step in this chain. So when you start to think about in your business what you're doing in each of these areas, Try to keep in the back of your head the part that looks the scariest, the part that you feel like you know the least about. That's what's determining your yield right now. Um, state of the art for airlines and data. The key message here, airlines keep literally hundreds of attributes for every single booking that anyone makes. And there's an incredibly long list of things that obviously I'm not going to read. It's very boring, uh, very gross. People live in this stuff all day long. Uh, another interesting thing here is they keep this data for all these attributes, even for incomplete bookings. So for the retargeters in the room that work with the airline industry, they probably know someone can literally retarget against every single one of these things for people that don't complete a booking. They keep track of all of it. The next step is segmentation. Once you have the data, what are you going to do with it? You've got to start putting it into some, some segments. That might start with seasonality continue through region, go more granular into individual cities and routes, day of week, directionality, individual audience or uh, you know, consumer behaviors. They'll keep going and going and going. With a couple key traits here. One is segmentation for an airline is holistic. It's not based on what's easy to do. It's not selective based on you know, what's right in front of them. They go as far as they can go with as many attributes as they can go to. And then and only then do they start putting these tens of millions of segments together into clusters of segments, groups of attributes, groups of groups that they can do further analysis later in the chain on. Then we get to forecasting. So once we've collected our data, once we've created our clusters based on the performance of these different things from a yield perspective, uh, in airlines, they forecast based on several different things. In ads, we tend to think of a supply forecast. How many avails am I going to have for this app and this placement for this time period? Uh, they, they go much, much further. First and foremost, they don't just do supply. They do demand forecasting. What do buyers actually want? over a certain time period? What might they be willing to pay? It turns out that's a very, very hard problem, and it's one of the reasons why we haven't tackled it really, honestly, anywhere in ads. In airlines, they do some really sophisticated math here. Uh, they might use multiple different models applied to each segment, uh, backcasting to determine which model is best for each segment. It's really, really sophisticated stuff that, quite honestly, I'm not really qualified to explain. But it's really, really important because it's going to enable some steps in optimization later, which is the second key message. The forecasting of supply and demand isn't just used at the time of booking. In ads, we tend to think of uh, a, a forecast of a certain number of impressions are available. Let's book that up for someone, or let's do a network deal where they get a blast campaign. You know, we're going to reserve that. 
uh, and then they're done, and we don't think about it again. Airlines actually use that information in real time when we get to this step. So here we're going to do one more show of hands exercise, at least one more. I have a little quiz here for you. This is about how they optimize routes in airlines. So we've got two routes here. We've got uh, a constrained flight from Heathrow to Barcelona. There's only one seat I can sell. I can potentially sell it to someone from Miami flying through Heathrow, or I can sell it to someone from JFK flying through Heathrow. The Miami flight, uh, I don't have a lot of demand for that. The JFK flight, I have a lot of demand for that. Miami gives me 800, Heathrow gives me 1,000. Raise your hand if you think I should take the $800 flight. Raise your hand if you think I should take the $1,000 flight. Raise your hand if you have no idea. I, I'm wondering what the other answer is, but that's okay. The answer is you actually take the $800 flight. And the reason for that is in the earlier phases, they've done, they've collected the data, they've done the segmentation, they've done the forecasting of both supply and demand, and they know something that in ads we wouldn't know. They know that they've got demand to move somebody from just JFK to Heathrow in an empty seat for way more than $200. Way more, the difference, more than the difference between uh, the 800 and the 1,000. And so that's real holistic yield management. Uh, again, incorporating concepts like demand forecasting that we don't do today. The last thing I'm going to talk about in state of the art is in the execution phase. And this is probably where things, quite honestly, depart the most from ads, but I think align with hopefully all of our vision for advertising going forward. An airline customer record system uh, is publishing availability and pricing to every demand source out there in real time. Every demand source. Hundreds of individual travel sites and thousands of travel agents and you know, their own airline booking portal. Everything gets access to every seat for a price all the time. Uh, they're able to do that because they do some things differently than we do. First of all, there's no concept of I'm going to give this to you and you decide what to pay me later, right? So that's something that happens in ads with rev share deals, with mediation, with other types of things where we say, you know, you might have this, tell me what you're gonna pay me later. And the second thing that's really important here is they've had the time to develop the control they need to handle things like two people trying to book the same flight at the same time. So when there are collisions, they're prepared to deal with that. And I think, Again, if we all think about our own business today, uh, RTB works a little bit like this, although RTB is a small part for a lot of us of really what's driving value. And actually, on that note, a final show of hands. Who uses RTB from a sell-side perspective today? Can you raise your hands, please? Who uses mediation? And who has a direct sales force? Okay. It's pretty normal. It's a good, it's a good mix. You know, this is very much like RTB in the sense that everybody has access to every seat. Imagine the entire universe of your inventory were available that way. It's pretty impressive. Now, why is that hard in mobile? So starting with data, uh, I think everyone that's experienced here is going to identify with a bunch of these challenges. It starts with the fact that we don't keep our data for very long. We don't keep it around. We don't have years of data sitting around. Sometimes we have a month. Sometimes we have two weeks. Sometimes we have none. Uh, it's probably not very granular. It's as granular as whatever you've set up in the system that you're using. If I have a 320 by 50 and a such and such an app, maybe that's all I have. That's what I know. Targeting data isn't always available. So when I execute, um, I think everyone here understands how valuable lat long data is. I might not have it on every impression. Data is decentralized across my partners. It's not in one system. I don't have accurate cross-device user identification information, so I don't know when I have one customer that's using me on a phone and a tablet that they're the same person. And then obviously, again, with multiple systems, you're going to experience some discrepancies. When we move into the second step in segmentation, uh, where airlines, if you remember, were really holistic 
thinking about absolutely everything under the sun. I think the term is boiling the ocean. Uh, in mobile, because of the systems and the ad ops resources that we have, we tend to be selective about the granularity that we look at our data. So the example that you see uh, in the graphics here, we probably start with OS. Hey, I have Windows, I have Android, I have iOS. And then maybe I look at one or two other things, when again, ideally, you would have the systems and the help, the tools you need to be holistic. The second thing that's not happening here is there's no clustering. Uh, the, the clusters are sort of de facto based on whatever your setup is. We're not thinking about the performance characteristics of each segment, how we can put things together, and how we can identify some of those $3,000 plane ticket buyers. When we move to forecasting, we have some other pretty major gaps. I said this before, don't really have a concept of forecasting demand in ads. You might know, you know, hey, I have a relationship with such and such a buyer. They like to re renew their campaigns with me every quarter. But I would be very surprised if anyone in, in this room can tell me how much they anticipate they're going to get for each piece of inventory more than a couple weeks in advance, and that they have that even in a spreadsheet you know, that's, that's actionable for them. Similarly, I mentioned this before. We don't use these insights. We don't have the forecasting. We don't always use the insights for execution when it's time to serve the ads. And now I'm going to go a little bit into the weeds on how prioritization works. Um, but I think it's important that we understand some of the details here so we can bring it back to the business context of why this is important. So best case in advertising, and this is the sort of my initiation of yield management and digital ads 10 years ago was that you have a two-tier system. We have campaigns that we guarantee in advance. They're a fixed CPM campaign. Uh, we probably have some kind of a, a floor price that we update based on something. Uh, we make exceptions when we're not sure. And everything else goes to a non-guaranteed or a class two bucket. This is typically prioritized based on price. Uh, and again, you know, some manual optimization of partners. If you're super sophisticated right now, you're talking to your partners about doing some kind of holistic yield where class one or direct and indirect class two compete. Um, what we see when we work with our clients in these solutions is that they look good on paper, but they're generally operationally intensive. Uh, they're relying on, you know, again, weaker links up the chain in data collection, segmentation, and forecasting that make the end result of it pretty ineffective. And then we, when we look at a more normal implementation in mobile, unfortunately, the picture gets more dire. So we're still using waterfalls that are pretty much entirely manual. Um, many to most of the demand, particularly mediation, is prioritized based on what we think someone will pay us, not what we know someone will pay us, essentially the opposite of that airline, you know, millions of demand partners all seeing the same price at the same time. Changes aren't made very frequently because it's hard to make changes, even when we have great intentions. And again, uh, the complexity is off the charts. When we talk more specifically about mediation, there are other attributes that make it tough. In a mediated environment, you're sending a batch of impressions to someone. They sort of take it all, probably not worried or probably not aware of the latency issues that they may be causing. Uh, uh, the, the bid prices, again, are based on best guess, not updated very frequently. And again, each one of these small issues is costing you money. And it will continue to cost all of us money until we make progress. So how do we do that? I've hopefully scared you and told you all the things that are terrible and difficult about uh, doing better yield management in mobile. What are some of the things that we can do? In the data area, I think this is a lot of blocking and tackling. I actually don't think there is a lot of major innovations that we need. We just need to do things that we're already doing a little bit better. Let's keep our data around longer. For the platforms that you work with today, ask your partner, ask your vendor, how long are you keeping the data around for me? Right after that, ask them, 
what data do you have available for me that you're not giving me? Do you have log level data? Do you have bid landscape data? Bid landscape data in RTB is the equivalent of all those people that got halfway through booking and didn't win. Right? That data is still really valuable, even when people don't buy things. Uh, I think there's a tremendous number of companies in the ecosystem that are focused on solving the lack of targeting data, also the cross-screen device uh, challenges. And uh, I think everyone is interested in working on doing a better job of consolidating data, putting it into you know, UIs, APIs, and so forth that people can use to see the entire system through one lens. And, and probably the grossest but most important thing, another thing that I think people should really talk to their platform partners about is troubleshooting tools. We see with almost every publisher out there uh, struggling with discrepancies between two different systems every day. Typically, they don't have the tools that they need to attack those problems, so they just ignore them. So that's another area where I really expect we're going to get better quickly. In segmentation, there's something very specific in mobile that I think people need to think about. Uh, segmenting inventory and tags in mobile has traditionally been kind of a copy of the desktop model, where it starts with app or site, then it goes to size. Uh, I actually think that's totally wrong for mobile. From what I've seen at, at Zynga and AppNexus and other places, the, the price that you expect to get from a piece of mobile inventory is determined first and foremost by the ad format, by the creative format, not the size. So with an interstitial, it's not uncommon to see a spread here, you know, of, if you include incentivized ads of, of 10x or more. And if you look inside a mediation platform that's typically used for this, you actually won't have data easily available that tells you what your supply is, what your demand is. You're probably getting an aggregate yield on that interstitial. No way to differentiate what's going on underneath. Another thing where you know, I think we can make changes right now with segmentation uh, is getting off of the idea that a region is a good cluster. If you look at North America, for example, we've got three, I think three different countries that have very, very different characteristics. If you move to Europe, uh, Africa, et cetera, you see the same phenomena. So instead of grouping countries conveniently because they're near each other on the map, you should be grouping countries based on their yield performance, right? Just because people are neighbors don't mean they have really anything to do with each other. And when you do analysis like that, we actually pulled one from a, a blinded client analysis that we did. We did that exact exercise. We looked at country level yield performance across a set of placements. Each one's a tag, essentially, in a system. The size of the bubble is how much we've delivered towards a particular placement. The yield performance is indexed. And what we find is these clusters are what we want to create our optimization around. These clusters have nothing to do with how close countries are on the map. It's a fun example. Moving into, uh, sorry, before we move into forecasting, another thing in segmentation that's fun. Uh, you might not have RTB. When we did the hand raising exercise a minute ago, you might just be mediation, you might be direct. But the, the key message is you can leverage data across channels so that something that looks unattainable in one, you can actually get smarter using data from another, another channel. In this example, we looked at, for a particular set of tags, again, a particular set of apps, uh, the, the volume relationship between volume and price. And you see that very pretty linear regression with an R squared above nine, which you almost never get, shows that there's a really, really strong correlation between volume and price. Then we looked at that uh, time of day hourly seasonality, uh, and we were able to take that data and then actually apply it to mediation bids. Even though that data is not available to us in mediation, we know that we can actually carve up mediation, adjust bids hourly based on the data from the other channel. And this one little trick alone drove something like 15% yield improvement across the mediation that was making up 75% of this particular app's revenue. 
Good stuff. In forecasting, we talked about this a little bit before, the typical MO is to start with a set of inventory. You know, you may have a great forecasting system or you might have a spreadsheet, but if you have a direct business, your salesperson's gonna come and say, hey, I have a client that wants to spend X with me, what price should I pay and how much can I sell them? Uh, the easy thing to do here is to say, I don't know what else is gonna come down the road, so I've got six million impressions left. If you sell it for three bucks, I'm happy. You might do that, you have an $18,000 I.O. booked, you have no more inventory to sell. If you incorporate a little bit more nuance in this process, you can substantially increase the amount of money you make, in this particular case, using dynamic pricing. So instead of giving that seller one rate, give them three rates. Give them three rates and an availability that's different for each of those rates. If you want all six million impressions that we have, charge $5. Uh, if you can only pay three, we'll book up three million. And what you've done is you've then reserved that inventory so later when you have indirect demand from RTB, from mediation, or someone else comes in and can pay a higher price, you've biased availability based on that price to increase yield. Another example of this that can happen in the forecasting stage, uh, if a direct advertiser wants to buy up a certain amount of inventory on your app for a certain time, and they have no preference about OS, if you've done your data collection and segmentation work, you probably know that different OSs yield different performance, different yield uh, in the indirect market. So instead of just saying, I'll just give the direct advertiser whatever impressions they want, first come, first serve, you would bias, you would book that inventory such that they get probably a little more Android and a little more Windows, save iOS for later. And then in the optimization phase. Uh, here we have an example where if I don't have a sense of what demand is coming, I have no confidence that I know what the future brings. So when someone brings a direct campaign to me, they bring that, essentially that $1,000 JFK to Barcelona flight for me. I'm gonna say let's book that up and I'm gonna get $5 on the first X percent of my audience and then I'm gonna get whatever is there for me when I'm done. However, if you've done some demand forecasting, even if you've just hacked it together based on what you can see in your past bookings, you have confidence of what is gonna come later in terms of both demand and supply, you'll have opportunities to take actually a lower price earlier on than your direct campaign, where that lower price is still higher than what you're gonna get later. And in this hypothetical example, you're gonna create something like a 10 or a 20% increase in the overall revenue and the yield that you get. So we talked about state of the art in ads, we talked about the challenges of execution in mobile. Now I wanna talk about what it looks like when we get to the future state here. So it's really about having an automated full stack that unifies the marketplace. Similar to that chart that I showed with you know, all, of the, all of the sources that you can buy an airline ticket from, seeing the same prices and the same availability all at the same time, that's a prerequisite here. And that's an attribute of the, the solution that we need. Second is, availability is gonna be based on price. The concept of one, one price, universal availability, uh, is very, very limiting in terms of the revenue that you can make. Third, bookings should be smart enough to preserve value. So if a particular client says, you know, I need this type of seat on this plane, and I'm fine with an aisle seat, uh, or sorry, a middle seat, you don't have to give them a window seat. For knowing supply and demand forecast, if you actually try to do some demand forecasting, you can make decisions that allow you to capture value in ways that you're not doing today. And then finally, we're gonna see a degree of automation and control. By that I mean, none of this is gonna be possible if your current selves or your ad ops team has to go in and do all of this work. Literally impossible. 
Uh, airlines have room full of people working on these things, but they are yield managers. They are not just traffickers. Uh, some of that stuff is going to have to continue for some time, but the future state is 90 plus percent of this is an automated process, and the people that are there are there to oversee that process, help the business make exceptions where you have relationships that dictate other approaches and other rules. I talked about a little bit before in the execution phase how what a challenge mediation is. I think everybody's pretty familiar with this. Let's talk about some of the specific things we're going to do to make that better. So again, instead of bid prices in mediation being based on large blocks of historical time, we're going to do intraday changes. I think we could get down to hourly or even better, essentially decreasing the size of these blocks and taking advantage of things like intraday seasonality. We're going to automate how we create segments and cluster them together. As I mentioned before, there's no way the people that we have today are, you know, have enough hours in the day and probably, quite honestly, the math skills that we need. I certainly don't to do this. So we're going to see that automated. Third is inside mediation, one of the biggest challenges we see is managing latency. I think everybody that has an app understands if you go too crazy with, latent, uh, too crazy with mediation, you have too many networks, you're going to find situations where in some countries, some devices, some connection types, latency is going to get out of control and your users are going to freak out. You're probably going to get nasty calls from your bosses. A good mediation solution in the future is going to be aware of latency and just automatically manage and, and bias bids to make sure that doesn't become a problem. Furthering the theme, the bids themselves are going to be automated. So the, uh, my personal experience is you know, no matter how much time you invest in trying to decide what the mediation waterfall looks like, the limiting factor isn't how good you do with that job, it's how often you do it. And speaking from personal experience, with the best of intention, you never do it nearly enough as you should. It has to be automated. And finally, pretty straightforward, but it's not there yet. Unified API, automated data aggregation across all of your sources with troubleshooting tools for discrepancies and all those types of things. All right, working towards a wrap up here. I'm going to give a, a quick summary of what we've talked about thus far, and then I'm going to give you some pro tips for things that I think you can do now to start testing some of these concepts and incorporating them into your business. So takeaways, yield management has been around for a long time. Uh, just as applicable to advertising as it is to airlines, we're probably as smart and amazing and talented and creative as we are, probably about 20 years behind, state of the art. And that's because we've got unique problems that are different. Nothing insurmountable, but we've got different problems to solve. The reason it's worth doing this is that the opportunity is monstrous. I think each one of the little tips and tricks and, and tools that we talked about is 2%, 5%, 10% type improvements. And that's on a base of a market that's growing more than 50% every year. And when we talked at the beginning about Ben and his $3,000 ticket and how that was essentially pure profit, I want to bring that back too. All of these little 2%, 5%, 10% things that you can do, raising your hand one inch higher falls right to the bottom line. You haven't changed your cost. You haven't changed user experience. You've probably improved it. Um, so every incremental percent you earn is substantial leverage on your profit margin. So what should you do coming out of this presentation? I'm going to encourage you to go back and look at what you have, talk to your partners, and do one or two things in each of these areas. First, audit your data. Talk to your partners. Find out what you have, what you don't have that they can give you. Look for the areas that you have discrepancies that are costing you time and money. And come up with a prioritized list of things that you can do to make it better. Hopefully your partners can help. 
Second, look at how you segment your inventory. If it's segmentation based on convenience, not segmentation based on performance, you're losing a ton of money. And the other pro tip here is, if you have multiple channels that you're operating, if you have an RTB channel, look for data insights there that you can apply in other channels. Because oftentimes, it's like free money. It's just sitting there. Forecasting. Uh, this one's probably the toughest, in my opinion. Uh, if you have a direct sales channel and a couple free hours, go look into your history and see if you can forecast what demand looks like. You never know. If you have a scaled business, some of us in this room do, then you probably can do a reasonably good forecast of your demand, and that's going to give you confidence to make different decisions later that are going to drive yield. Once you've done that, do your best to put the supply and the demand forecast together. Typically, the, the, the ads version of holistic or unified yield is, I will take a class two or indirect impression if it pays higher than my class one impression right now. If you put these two things together, you might actually have the confidence to take a lower priced impression now that you have confidence that you'll make good on later and drive a yield increase. And then finally, smarter mediation. If you've done the work to look into your data and you've done the segmentation analysis, you've thought about whether you're segmenting based on convenience or performance, you've done some forecasting work, this, that, and the other, looked at what you can get from RTB, you're going to have a handful of things to go talk to your partner about that they can help you with. Uh, if they're not able to, to talk to you about how they're going to automate mediation features for you. Uh, they should be able to talk to you about what types of optimization algorithms they're using, what data they have that they're using. Maybe you'll find there's some things that they can do for you that they haven't yet. So to wrap it up, uh, huge opportunity to drive massive profit improvement for your businesses based on some of the things that we've talked about here. Uh, these are all things that our team that I showed the pictures of earlier are spending a great deal of time thinking about, and we're incredibly excited to bring this future to you uh, as soon as we can. So thank you very much, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Andrew.